Hi everybody, you're now experiencing the Gretna Bill Show. You know, to be honest with you, it's a nice day, I should be riding. This whole presidential campaign thing is, is exhausting. I mean, that's the reason why I never ran for public office to begin with, because it's like you got to try to explain shit, and then all everybody wants to do is tear you down, and it's just exhausting, and I should just be riding my bike. And look, no racing this year. I didn't even shave my leg. I know that sounds gay to a lot of you, but yeah, eventually I'll shave my legs, I guess. And I'll get back into it. But, um, all right. So I guess, first of all, we, we want to, I got a couple of ideas to pick up where we left off before. Um, so, you know, what we said was the constitution is the root of all this and it establishes article one, two, and three. Article one is the legislative branch. Article two is the executive branch. Article three is judicial. And we decided when Ed was here that really, the president just enforces what these guys do. The, the president doesn't run the country. He just enforces what we the people want. But there's a whole shitload of reasons why that doesn't happen. So one of the things we decided was term limits is a problem. You get, you get people in office and they just don't leave. And then they get money from the industrial military complex. And they get money from PAC groups. And everything gets perverted and distorted. So, so... Uh, the only thing I want to say here was that I got a solution to the term limit thing. We, we need term limits. So how are we going to do that? I'm going to try to keep this a lot shorter than an hour and 14 minutes. Um, the way we're going to do that is, let's say, um, term limit overlap. So we all agreed last time that we could use term limits and it would kind of break up that career politician uh, or the swamp, as, as, as Donald Trump would say. And we all don't like the swamp. We try to break that up with term limit overlap. So I guess what I mean is kind of an apprenticeship program. So let's say that you get elected to uh, the Senate of the United States, and it's, what, a six-year term? So if you're the incumbent, the next guy coming in gets elected. He actually serves six years, but you overlap. Does that make sense to you, Josh? Yeah. So So in other words... Before his term is over of six years, the new senator comes in and serves as an apprentice for a year. He just sits there and observes. So then we get out of this thing about how the guy leaves office and the next guy comes in, he doesn't know what the hell's going on. So if you can accomplish term limits and say that you get elected a year before and the incumbent's got to stay in office for a year and kind of put you through an apprenticeship program, term overlap and tell you, hey, this is the way it's going on and stuff. This is what you got to do. And now go for it. So that's the one thing that I came up with was term limits overlap, basically serve an apprenticeship program or a mentorship program so that you understand what the job is that you're supposed to be doing. So therefore, a citizen could step in there. So, you know, one day he's running a cabinet shop. The next day he's senator of the United States. Not a problem. He, got to, he has a year overlap. He could figure it out. OK, and we try to break up this pack monopoly, this this uh, career politician, this this Washington elite stronghold that, you know, none of us really agree with or relate to. I don't know. Like we said last time, I don't even know who Mitch McConnell and all these guys up there, they don't look like me. They don't act like me. They don't do anything that I wanted to do. You know, screw them, whatever. So governed by the people, for the people, of the people. And, and make no mistake about it. Let's not forget what the whole constitution is. We're paying the government. We're subcontracting them. Okay. We're subcontracting them to run the constitution. It's not like they're taking over and they're your daddy, they're your principal, they're your boy. No, 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 no. We're in charge, okay? So, like, I got a garbage man, Josh, right? He comes, he picks up the garbage, he stays out of my face, doesn't give me any shit, he sends me a bill. Okay, that's what I want the federal government to do. Manage the freaking constitution, stay the fuck away from me, okay? And then, you know, just do your job, okay? And don't get in my face. Because I'm in charge. I am paying you to do this job. Okay? You're not, you're not telling me what to do. Okay? Well, of course, it doesn't work like that. But that's the way it's supposed to work, right? Yeah. You're subcontracting the federal government to manage the Constitution, and you're paying for it as a citizen. They are not in charge. You are in charge. How simple is that? 
So that's why the legislature is in charge. That's why the president's job should be freak easy. He's the executive, Article 2. All he does is enforce what the legislature lays down and what the judicial says is okay, it's constitutional. That's all the president does. He's not the leader. He's not whatever he's doing. I don't know what the freak he's doing, but he, he, he's not in charge, okay? Of course, that's a dreamland. Bill, you must be drunk, dreaming, or crazy. But it's life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And if I want, and I'm giving you a really a simple example, like I'm a simpleton. If I want to ride my bike all day, okay, as long as I pay my taxes, all right, and I send a legislature to say, hey, all these guys want to do in Mount Gretna is ride their bike and drink beer, and you stay the fuck away from me. Okay, that's what they're going to do. We are in charge by the people, for the people, of the people. We pay them to manage the Constitution. And why do we pay them? It's because, dude, I'm involved with life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You're not telling me what's happiness for me. You're not telling me how to pursue my life. Okay, I'm telling you. Okay, MFR, I'm telling you how I am going to enjoy this planet. Okay, you're not telling me. I'm hiring you to run the Constitution, and I'm telling you. So I'm belaboring the point, Josh, but do you get what I'm saying? Yeah. Is it unreasonable? No. It's not That's the way it all started. So it all started like George Washington. We fear ourselves from the, from the idiot king of England. And then, you know, we're all sitting back and we're going, George, okay, now we're free, dude. So uh, we wrote this constitution to ensure that this never happens again. And then how about you being the first president? George is like, fuck that. I ain't doing that shit. I'm going back to the farm, dude. And everybody else looks around who wrote the constitution and goes, well, I ain't doing that. That's the shittiest job in the world. We're getting back to that. I said, I ain't doing that crap either. And it's like, no, you got to, man. Somebody's got to do it. And it was at that time, by the way, that George Washington, as all his kumbas, said, don't start political parties or ruin the whole damn thing. Okay, so anyway, all right, term limits, term overlap, so you're an apprenticeship program. And the government really doesn't understand that we're in charge, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. We'll tell you what we want to do with our life. Okay, you won't tell us how to run our lives. We'll tell you, government by the people, for the people, of the people. That's not really an arguable matter, right? But it's not like that, is it? No, okay. Not at all. Okay, so I'll quit belaboring that point and I'm going to try to move on. But that's all I'm saying. And so I'm saying to you that I'm not suggesting a, decro a dr draconian overthrow of the government or anarchy or anything like that. I'm just saying we can tweak shit a little bit, okay, and gradually get a little control back. Okay, and, and you're saying, well, did they take control? It's like, yeah, they did. And then I base that on Machiavelli, power corrupts, absolutely. And once you get in that position, you're a normal guy. We talked about that with Ed. You're, you're a normal guy. You go in, you want to do something good for America. You want to run for political office. But then you get, you get corrupted. And then all of a sudden, you start listening to guys from, you know, big drug companies and everything. Say, no, this is the way we've got to do it, dude. And you're like, well, wait a minute. It's like, look, we can help you get elected if you, if, if you do what we're, you, you know the whole story. You guys all know it. I don't have to belabor that point. I should be riding. This is bull crap. But anyway. <laughs> um, so anyway, there was some stuff that I've read over my life. You know, I was an economics major. I graduated Penn State in economics. And so I've been trying to figure out why this isn't so, as I told you in the last episode. And um, I've been trying to figure that out the rest of my life. So, so one of the things I've been doing is revisiting some of the literature that I was kind of reading in 1970s when I went to Penn State about economic theory and about how this shit's supposed to work. So now look at this thing. This is a great one. I, I did get it. And of course, I didn't reread it. Look at that thing. Okay. It's Adam Smith, The Wealth of Nations. This is fundamental in understanding how the economy, a capitalist economy works. And I don't expect anybody to read that. Look at that. I didn't even read it in college. I did the cliff notes. But anyway, if you care to understand that Adam Smith, The Wealth of Nations, the foundation of what we're doing. Here was another book that I loved that you can read and get if you, if you want to try to figure shit out. John Locke. Okay, John Locke, The Second Treaties of Government and the Letter Concerning Toleration. Great little piece. Oh, how many of you people, if you don't have this book, the U.S. Constitution, okay? If you don't have the U.S. Constitution and you haven't even glanced over it, then you don't got shit to say, okay? Get it done damn copy of the Constitution and read it and figure out what the hell that your politicians are supposed to be doing. If you don't have a copy of the Constitution in your house, shame on you. 
U.S. Constitution. Article 1, 2, 3. Duh. Duh. <laughs> this is a beauty. Common sense. Thomas Paine. Okay? You got to get a copy of this. Look, it's thin. You can even read it. You can glance through it. It's not going to kill you. Okay? Um, this is interesting. Uh, Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, and John Jay. The Secretary of State at the time. The Federalist Papers. Federalist Papers. And, of course, there's the Anti-Federalist Papers. But anyway, if you care to, good stuff. Now, uh, you know, I had to reread this. Plato's Republic. All right? Now, this, is, this is where I'm coming from, a lot of what I'm doing. Let me read the back of this book, of what the Plato's Republic really is about. The Republic concerns itself chiefly with the question of what is justice as well as Plato's theory of ideas and his conception of the philosopher's role in society. That's kind of what I am, a philosopher. You know, I'm a two-bit, bicycle, beer-drinking, you know, know-nothing philosopher. So, uh, to explore the latter, he invents the allegory of the cave to illustrate his notion that ordinary men are like prisoners in a cave, observing only the shadow of things. While philosophers are those who venture outside the cave, and see things as they really are. And that's all I'm trying to do. I'm just trying to separate myself from all the bullshit when I'm riding 101 miles like I did a couple of days ago with Ed. You know, I got a lot of time to think about shit. Six hours. And this is what I think about. I don't know what you guys think about when you're riding 100 miles. Okay. While philosophers are those who venture outside the cave and see things as they really are. And whose task it is to return to the cave and tell the truth. To return to the cave. So I get off my 100 mile bike ride and I return to the cave and I'm here to tell you what I believe is the truth. All right? So it is, and whose task it is to return to the cave and tell the truth about what they have seen on the outside. This dynamic metaphor expresses at once the eternal conflict between the world of senses, i.e., the cave, and the world of ideas, i.e., the world outside the freaking cave. And the philosopher's role as a mediator between the two. Plato's Republic. Great read. And finally, now we go into today's dissertation. And you know I've been talking about MMT. If you follow me on Bookface, I've been on talking about modern monetary theory. Which, let me explain, is a complete deviation from what I learned and what most of us believe to be a true about macroeconomics. And this thing started in the 90s, and it's kind of been evolving since. So there's a lot of fathers of, of this, of modern macroeconomic theory. Minsky is probably the beginning of that, okay? So if you want to try to figure shit out, read Why Minsky Matters, and it's by L. Randall Ray. Randy Ray is probably one of the most active, prolific authors, scholars that talk about modern economic theory. And I've been studying him, reading him, and I have to agree it makes sense. Now there's others, and I'm going to write them down over here to the right, if you care, to explore things. And I'm going to write down some names. So Minsky, Mitchell, Mosler, and oh, by the way, I'm doing a tuck today. Okay, somebody said, dude, you tuck your shirt in like an old man. <laughs> you know what I mean? And pull your pants up and shit so you got that. But mainly, I'm tucking today because of the peace sign belt. What have I got? Okay. So anyway, Minsky, Mitchell, Mosler. He's the same guy from Mosler Automotive. Okay, he was a hedge fund manager in the United States, rich, famous guy. Went over to Italy. They were asking him about the lira. And, you know, um, they were trying to figure out you know, they had rampant inflation and the Lira was devaluating and they're saying, dude, you got to help us out, figure this shit out. And um, also, note to all of you, all the primitive currencies are basically a unit of measure of weight. You got the pound, the Lira, the peso. That's how they all started. It was like a unit of weight, kind of, that progressed into my, But anyway, all right, I digress. But Mosul Automotive, the guy also invented some cars and shit. So he's a brainiac. So you got Minsky, Mitchell, Mosler, and then recently, Ray. Randall Ray. Check him out. Um, I don't think I missed anybody. If you, you, get it. You, you follow those guys and you'll get what I'm saying. So, 
Um, yeah. Okay, so today we want to talk, and those are all M's, man, so it's perfect for modern monetary theory. So, in my quest, as Plato would have me do, to step outside the cave and go, what's really happening here? We did it here, and we understood that you don't really elect a president to run the country. The president just enforces what the legislative branch does, which is you and me, which is by the people, for the people, of the people, life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Not what the government wants to be happy with, okay? What we want to be happy, okay? It's up to us to determine what the government does. And if we want to pursue happiness by riding a bike all freaking day, then that's what they should be doing, because that's what we're paying them to do. I don't get what's so complicated about that. All right. So anyway, I'm trying to step outside the cave and figure out what the hell's really going on. So I kind of did that, and I've been talking with um, a Lebanon native who has a PhD in economics, actually works for the economic, um, works for the ag department in Washington for the government. And so a lot of times I read all this shit and I go, yeah, here's what I think's happening, but I'm not sure. So I kind of chat with her. She's a PhD in economics. And I say, hey, is this really what's happening? And she said, yes, Bill, pretty much you're right. So now we're getting into today's theory about how I'm trying to figure out what's going on. So we know what's going on there, which is bull crap. And so now trying to figure out how are these guys financing all this? That's the next thing. So I would guess that if any of you went and asked your, your local politicians or your state senator or your, your senator representative or representative to Congress of the federal government to explain modern monetary theory and how it is that we actually create money, I guarantee you that you will see a moonwalk kind of thing. You will see a professional backpedaling like you never saw before. And I defy and dare any of you to do that. They will not understand how the hell we actually finance this whole program. I dare you, do it. And so, you know, I asked Josh that um, what I wanted to do was play a song that pretty much explains everything. And it's by a group called Dire Straits, Mark Knopfler on guitar, which is money for nothing and your chicks for free. Josh, remember that? Yeah. Money for nothing and your chicks for free. And ironically, it's dire straits, right? Because we're in dire straits right now. It's, it's beautiful. It's so poignant. So here's the way it works. So like up until like 67 or so, we're on the gold standard. So that means we were printing reserve notes. All, all the dollar bill is an IOU. It's all it is. Okay, let's not get too... Me look at it, it's a Federal Reserve note. It says, all right, you know, it's an IOU. The government owes you a dollar. We've long since gone off the gold standard. So, in the meantime, everyone, most politicians would have you believe that microeconomic policies rule the world. In other words, what rules your personal finances and your local business finances and your local government municipality and your state government is that you've got to balance the budget. You've got to balance the budget, Bill. It's a, two, it's a dual entry accounting system. You got assets over here, you got liabilities over here. And you gotta balance the damn thing. You can't just create money out of thin air. So modern, modern monetary theory says, hold on. You can do that. And not only can you do it, but we've been doing it. Now, we first dabbled in it, Hoover did it in, in, in World, uh, World War I and during that period, and then leading into the Depression. And then FDR did it. In, in the 40s, he kind of created money out of thin air. He actually tried to, to pull in all the gold reserves of the United States, which was interesting. Um, and then Reagan did it. Reagan did it to get, a, get us out of a mess that uh, Paul Volcker got us into with 20% interest rates on a treasury. And then um, Obama did it. Obama, like 2010, 2011, we were in this uh, recession. Everybody was stressed, high unemployment. So Obama's like, I think we can create money. So he created $400 billion. And he actually wanted to create another $400 billion, never got to it. But he did it like kind of dangerously. I was like, I don't know if we can do this and get away with it. So then 
we go to the future, we go to now, present time. So now all holds are, are all, everything is like wide open. So obviously we've gone to 25 trillion in debt. So Josh, I don't know if you get a chance, but you could put up the debt clock and that thing is spinning. That red dial is spinning like crazy. And we're going 23 trillion, 24 trillion, 25 trillion. Now put this into perspective. How many seconds, how many seconds have elapsed time-wise since the dinosaurs roamed the earth? One trillion. One trillion. That's a long freaking time, right? That's how many seconds. How much are we in debt right now? You've been paying attention? Twenty-five trillion. Dude, dude, you can't even imagine that. So don't even think for a second that we're ever going to pay that debt off. Never. So you're like, okay, now how does this work? How does this work? Well, it works like this. The government has learned, like all governments around the world, that they can actually create money as long as they keep control of their sovereign currency. And the only, as monetary money, monetary, modern monetary theory suggests, is that you can create money almost indefinitely without creating commensurate death, debt, <laughs> debt, without creating commensurate death, and without balancing the budget, as long as you make sure you don't. You monitor inflation and you monitor the interest rates, which is that's why if you watch CNBC every day, every Friday, what do they talk about? The unemployment rate, the, the Fed fund rate of interest and the unemployment rate and you just want and inflation. So if you monitor those three things, you could theoretically create money out of thin air. And that's where dire straits comes in money for nothing and your chicks for free. So you say, how is that possible? What about hyperinflation? Uh, all your all your Republican kumbas would tell you that, well, you, you see what happens if you put Bernie Sanders in. There's no free lunch. You can't just create money. Look what happened to Venezuela. Look what happened to Argentina. Look what happened to Germany, uh, you know, post-World World War I after the Treaty of Versailles saddled them with all this reparation debt. And they were going with wheelbarrows full of cash. You've seen all those examples. And all, all your Trumpers are good with that. It's like, this is what will happen. It's like, mm, 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 not. So what this theory suggests is, is that as long as you can improve productivity of your, of your society, and as long as you can increase the productive capacity of your society, then you will never experience hyperinflation. So therefore, there is no problem in creating money out of thin air. And... Um, so when you had hyperinflation, like I always like to use, and so do all these guys, they like to use Zimbabwe as an example, because Zimbabwe, uh, you know, they threw out the English or whatever, and uh, they gave all the warlords that helped them overthrow the, the, the current government, they gave them land, they gave them agriculture, and they said, okay, go after it, boys. And they kept creating more money, more currency, and, they, and it hyperinflation ensued. But it wasn't because they created more money. It was because they were unable to produce agriculture because they didn't know how to farm. So hyperinflation is only caused when there is intrinsic problems within the economic structure of any given country. So um, I'll give you a, a, a real-time example. So right now, we in the last 60 days, we created $2 trillion dollars. And monetary theory suggests there was no debt created to match that. There was no bonds sold, okay? Nothing. They just keystroked it. So you got the federal bank account, and they keystroked 2.2 trillion digits. Digits, digits. They didn't even print the damn money. Digits. And then they moved that to the U.S. Treasury Department. Digits. And then they moved it to the banks. And then the banks, the Federal Reserve banks, and the banks moved at the local banks, and the money was distributed to the people. All right, so, so we created 2.2 trillion with no commensurate debt and no bonds being sold. We just created it out of thin air. So if you doubt anything that I'm saying, or if you doubt modern monetary policy or theory, then just look at what we did in the last 60 days. There was no debt sold. We just created, we keystroke digits, and it went into the economy. Soon it got into the economy, it was spent, tax dollars were generated, and the cycle continues. So what it suggests is that you can almost do that indefinitely as long as you can keep the interest rates low, inflation at a minimum, 
and keep inflation at a minimum by making sure the productive capacity of your society can handle the excess money supply. Now, I'm give you another real-time example. Josh, you don't eat meat. But just yesterday, you saw on the news or the day before, that we had food inflation of nearly 46. That was the greatest in nearly 46 years. So you got to ask yourself, was that due to excess money supply? In other words, are we slipping into hyperinflation? No. It was due that we it was due to the fact that we couldn't meet demand for a product, namely meat and vegetables, because we couldn't pick them because they're but mainly meat. And I'll give you that specific example because what happened to all the meat processing plants, Josh? They got shut down. They got shut down. So so there again, it wasn't so hyperinflation starts to ensue in food prices, not because of excess money supply, but because of the demand was there, but the lack of productive capability to produce the meat. So it didn't have nothing to do with excess money supply. So you, you can use Zimbabwe, you can use Venezuela, you can use anything you want. It's problems intrinsically with the productive capacity of the society not due to increased money supply. So another thing happened just recently. Uh, China bought one third of Ecuador. One third. So you need to ask yourself, why the freak did Ecuador sell one third of their land? Because they had to. Why did they have to? Because they gave up their sovereign currency. Okay? So they adopted the US dollar as their currency of choice. Seems like a good idea, right? US dollar stable. The problem was is that when they ran out of cash, they were they were like, oh shit. We don't have control over our currency, so we can't create any more money. So what are we going to do? Because we're bound to the U.S. dollar. So what did they do? They sold land to generate cash to China. Okay? Now, okay, that's that thought. So here's another thought. Right now, when you look at the huge amount of debt, and again, not all this money we've created is tied to debt. It's not. It's just created out of thin air. Money for nothing and chicks for free. Okay, so, so who owns the debt that we have created over the years? Well, the most of it is owned by Japan. They own like 1.6%. 1.6% of the de debt that's created. And remember, lately, we haven't even been creating debt. We've just been printing money with no commensurate debt. And then China's second at one point whatever. So who holds the rest of that debt, Josh? Uh, you do. do. The U.S. Treasury does. So they create the debt, and they put it in the U.S. Treasury, and of course, that's where it all sits. And so nobody's going to call that debt in, right? Nobody's going to call that debt. It just sits there. You hold your own debt. So it's brilliant. And it's not just us. It's every, it's every developed country in the world. And if you look at international investment around the world, what they do is chase government stimulus. So wherever there's more stimulus, wherever there's more money for nothing and chicks for free is where they invest. Okay. They're not stupid. And so every company, every country that has control of their own sovereign currency is printing money like there's no tomorrow. So it would be like if you went down to the candy store with your buddies when you're 11 years old. All right. And you, your dad had a budget set out for you and said, you cut the grass and, you know, I'll give you so many dollars and you can go buy candy. You show up at the candy store and all your buddies got like three, four times as much money. And you're like, well, how'd you get that money? Right? And it's like, well, my dad just printed it. <laughs> and, and they go, well, what, what the hell? How does that happen? So, so you see... That now it becomes a race. Every industrialized country like Canada, like Australia, that still use the dollar, like Switzerland, like London, that still have control over their own currency, their own sovereign currency, will never go bankrupt because they can always print money when they need to. Unlike all the other countries that have lost control. That's why I suggest that the euro dollar is in trouble in the long run. Because like countries like Greece, 
that get into trouble financially. We all know about Greece. They're bankrupt like crazy. The reason why they're bankrupt is because guess what? They can't produce their own currency. They're bound to the euro dollar. They got to go beg the euro dollar bank and the IMF for money because they can't produce their own. So I don't want to belabor that point, but I want to ask you, Josh, you've been listening to this. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. Is there anything there that I said? It all makes sense. Okay. Not, it's, it totally makes sense, right? Yeah. So now we get back to the fact, do our politicians that are running the country who are trying to produce budget deficits and say, oh, you can't spend it there. You can't spend it on NPR. You can't give the money to NASA. You, you can't give the money to uh, the uh, Performing Arts Center, the Kennedy Performing Arts Center, because you're, you're crazy. You're Bernie Sanders. You're nuts. It's like you can do anything you want to. Okay, so that's where I get into this fact that budget deficits and budgets are merely a social construct. All they are is produced by politicians who don't even really know what the freak they're doing. They just do it because, you know, everybody's doing it. Again, you go back to asking your local politician how the hell money's created, and he's going to backpedal the shit out of you. He's going to moonwalk right off the stage. So basically, um, you can create money out of thin air, and politicians really don't yeah. understand it, and so they use budget deficits as a way to modify your social behavior. So then you get back to Eisenhower, which is beware of the military-industrial complex. So up until after World War II, we use budget deficits to try to say, hey, we got to go stop in Vietnam or the communists will kill us. And then we got to stop drugs coming into the country. So we had to war against drugs. That's where we got to spend our money. And then you had the war in Iraq. You go, we got to stop Saddam Hussein. I remember Bush telling us, if you don't stop him there, he's going to take over the world like Hitler did. It's like, cut me a fucking break. All right? No, that ain't going to happen. Okay? So... So what, what I'm suggesting is, is that up until this point in time, you can spend this created money any way you want to. You can form your own paradigm. You can pursue happiness any way you want to. But what we have been done, what's happened to America, is that we've been convinced that the military-industrial complex is where we've got to spend our money. I think over, over this military spending over the entire globe, we spend 40% of it. On military, so we're basically trying to be the policeman of the world and telling everybody that you got to stop the terrorists or they're going to kill us, and that's where we've been spending our money. But you can spend your money on just as easy on infrastructure, healthcare, and education. But we chose not to choose that paradigm because politically it was difficult to convince people of that. The Democrats are trying to do that. Bernie Sanders is trying to do that. The Republicans are countering and saying, "No, no, no, dude, we need a big military. You got to protect yourself, otherwise the commies will get us." or the Iraqis will get us, or the Muslims will get us. And so that's what I've always said online, you can see me, uh, you live by the sword, die by the sword. That's what I was trying to explain. It's like, you can spend your money any way you want. So now you look at that global spending in the military, we got 40% of that chunk. How much is China spending on it? Like 5%. Because they're like, I ain't worried about terrorism, dude. So what are they spending their money on? They're building cities that don't even have people in them. They're going to, they're building bullet trains, okay? They're building islands in the, in the South Pacific. They're, they're buying up Ecuador. They bought Jamaica. Trust me, I was down there every year. They bought, like, I think they own 40% of Africa. So that's what they're doing with their money. What are we doing with our money? We're spending it on a negative return on investment. We're spending it on Afghanistan, Iraq, and shit. And so um, we're not buying Ecuador, man, okay? <laughs> we're, we're, we're spending money in, in Iraq, just like we spent money in Vietnam. It's bullshit, okay? It's a shitty investment. But it's politically palatable to most Americans. Not most, but you get where I'm going. Josh, does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. Okay, so Eisenhower is the first to point it out. It irritates me, but it makes sense. Right, no, it irritates everybody. So, because it's getting in the way of pursuit of happiness. Yeah. And it's a false narrative, bullshit narrative. Just like that, did you ever see, boy, I, I sent that around, the, uh, the Black Bush when Chappelle was is going over the, the false narrative leading up to the Iraq war. What a crock of shit, okay? We could have spent that money on infrastructure. So I'm going to leave you with, with an optimistic note because I've belabored all these points too much and I'm, I'm, I could care less. Um, so um, um, what I'm saying is you can, you can spend the money any way you want. You can shape your own paradigm. And you're convinced by your political leaders that you need to spend it on military because that's the only way you'll be safe. 
I'm suggesting that's a bunch of crap and no other country is doing that. They're spending their money on infrastructure, education, and healthcare. And we're spending it on war. So that is what I see as a silver line to this COVID thing is that we're going to finally go, you know what? We've got to go back to like World War II and have work projects. We got to go FDR on this thing. We got to have, we got to start rebuilding infrastructure. We got to focus on projects at home to motivate people to go to work, to spend money, and we'll create the money and we build a stronger United States. And in doing that, that's the silver line to the COVID thing because we're going to start focusing on healthcare, pandemic preparedness, education, infrastructure rebuild. Instead of worrying about what goes on in Iraq and Iran, screw them. Okay, so I guess that's the moral of the story is don't let politicians, federal politicians, tell you that the budget has got to, you know, don't let the budget deficits dictate where we have to go because it's bullcrap because you can, you can create money out of thin air if you do it right. And every other country in the world that has the ability to control their sovereign currency is doing it. And we need to keep up. And that gets back to when you go into the candy store. You need to go in there with just as much money as the guy next to you. And as long as there's plenty of candy, right? So as long as your productive capacity is up to snuff, there won't be hyperinflation. Because no matter how much money you have in your pocket, you will spend it on candy. Right, Josh? Yeah. When you were 11 years old, what would you do? As long as the supply was infinite, you'd be what? What would you be doing? Buying I'll candy. take that. I'll take that. I'll take that. Oh, and then what happens when the, when the store, when the candy store guy brings it in? He pulls the money in and what's he do? He pays taxes to the federal government. And it's a big cycle. I love that because I like to use the word cycle. Bicycle, <laughs> economic cycle, m money creation. Right. It's just, yeah. So you get it. So just don't be bullshitted by your federal politicians. That's a bunch of crap. And there's really no difference between Republicans and Democrats because they don't really understand what the freak they're doing. They're just trying to convince you to vote for them. And they're trying to do it by, by telling you that this is the way the budget's going to be. I'll give, you another, I'll give you another case in point. Every year when we spend more than what we have, what happens? They, you know this, Josh, right? They have a, a, a budget deficit ceiling, right? And everybody goes, oh, they're going to shut the government down, right? Yeah. Right, right? That's yeah. a bunch of crap. They're never going to shut the government down. They will always print money. Okay, that's another that's another scare tactic. It's like they're not shutting the government down because they can produce money out of thin air. Money for nothing and your chicks for free. I hope you don't violate any copyrights. And <laughs> I'm going to go ride my bike and drink beer. Peace out, everybody. And remember, I may never, ever talk about running for president again because it's a pain in my ass. And I don't really think most people listen or care what the frick I'm saying anyway. So I'm not wasting any more of my time doing it. But suffice it to say that if nominated, I will not run. If elected, I will not serve. Because I don't think you guys are worth it. And you do whatever you want to do. I'm just telling you how it is. Plato's Republic, brother. Go outside the cave and figure out what the hell's going on. And last but not least, I still have these t-shirts, man. I got tons of t-shirts. So if you want a t-shirt, uh, Josh has the graphic to put up. Uh, they're a collector's item because I might be ending my campaign right now. So Gretna Bill 2020, no left turn on stone. And the only way I'll continue this is if you people demand it. And I know you won't because we're all too busy getting in the summer and riding bike and drinking beer and doing whatever else we want to do. Life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. We determine what that is, not these guys, okay? Not the president, okay? Not Biden, not Trump, not anybody. We determine where the hell we want to do with our money and what the hell we want to run this country. So it's up to us, it's not up to them. So get back control of the legislature, term limits, term limits overlaps. And, and you know, this is not draconian. I'm not talking about anarchy or overthrowing the government. I'm talking about little subtle changes, just little subtle changes to get back a little bit more. So, um. So what's happened over the last 40 years since World War II, was it been longer? It's 40, 60 years, is that the, the military industrial complex has benefited the most from this. So, so the money's created and the military industrial complex has, has benefited more than you and I. And there's nothing wrong with that because they can, they have the hammer, they're using it, right? They have the hammer, they'll use it. Power corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. So I'm not faulting them. But it's just, I'm just telling you folks, 
you need to get back a little bit of that action. Okay, and you need to understand that these guys are not running the country. You and I are running the country, and uh, so be it. So, Josh, can you add anything to this before we bore him, bore these people anymore? Yeah, I think you said it all. All right, peace out. Ride bike, long live long rides. Love you all.